everyone, Ryan Jackson here. I hope you're having a great day. So we've made it all the way to chapter seven on our 100 days of the 2023 National Electrical Code. I hope you've been enjoying it thus far and I hope that you're able to use it as a, as a tool in your understanding of the 2023 NEC. Uh, we've got a couple of videos to do on Article 700, which covers emergency systems. Uh, there was quite a lot that happened in 700, but I didn't want to do, you know, 15 videos on it. So we're just going to do two videos. The first one is going to cover transfer equipment, and then the second one will cover some of the emergency lighting changes uh, that were made in Article 700. So this one is on 700.5 transfer equipment. Let's take a look. All right, 700.5, transfer equipment. New requirement for redundant transfer equipment was added. Okay, the, the code language here isn't perfect. I mean, it, it seldom is. You know, I, I'm guilty of, of writing things that aren't perfectly clear as well. But I think the idea here is, is pretty clear. If a single feeder supplies emergency loads, then redundant transfer equipment or a bypass isolation transfer switch is required to allow for maintenance without loss of power. If it's manually operated, then a qualified person needs to supervise it during maintenance or repair. All right, so we're recognizing that things need to be maintained, obviously. Uh, if you have an emergency generator, uh, you need to maintain the generator. And sometimes that requires you to take the generator offline and do whatever maintenance is necessary on it. Something as mundane as changing the oil or anything else. So. A few code cycles ago, we added requirements in Article 700 saying, look, if you, if you have a backup generator that you're using for your emergency power, now, let's be clear here. We're talking emergency power, not optional standby, all right? The generator at your house is not an emergency system. When we're talking about emergency systems, we're talking about big commercial buildings, high-rise hospitals, you know, actually legally required emergency systems all right so if we have an emergency system generator we might need to take the generator offline to maintain it so when that happens a couple of code cycles ago we added a requirement for what a lot of people call a docking station which means that you can remove the generator from service and you can hook up a temporary portable generator just in case the you know the, the world comes to an end while you're in the middle of maintaining the generator. I mean, what if what if the utility loses power while the generator is offline? We we can't jeopardize the lives of all the occupants. So, we have to have provisions to add a temporary generator while we're maintaining the normal generator. This is kind of similar because maintenance uh, uh, transfer switches often will need maintenance as well. So for the same reason, if I'm maintaining my transfer switch when the utility loses power or something bad happens, we can't just risk the lives of all the occupants of the building. We have to have redundant transfer equipment or what I think the code is, is really kind of trying to nudge you to do is to use what's called a bypass isolation transfer switch. And a bypass isolation transfer switch allows you to maintain the transfer switch without taking it offline and without doing it unsafely. You know, I mean, a person, I guess, could always maintain a transfer switch while it's hot. It would be incredibly stupid and dangerous and not only violate OSHA and NFPA 70E, but just be a bad idea. So we need people to maintain things. We need the emergency system to remain operational while we're doing it. So how do we do both of those things at the same time? Well, we either install a second transfer switch, you know, so we can use one while we maintain the other and then flip them back and maintain the other while I'm using the other one. Or if I don't want to buy two, buy a bypass isolation transfer switch. And that's what we're looking at here in the photograph. This is a real world example. This is at a, uh, at a hospital that I was fortunate enough to, to tour. These are both uh, bypass isolation transfer switches. And I'll see if we can uh, zoom in a little bit here. There we go. So you can see we've got a bypass isolation transfer switch. To go in automatic mode, you do this. And then to bypass the ATS, you can change it by doing this. And you can do this to test it. You can remove it. And there's your instructions on how to do it. So it allows you to remove components without losing the functionality of the transfer equipment. And then when we look inside of it, uh, this is kind of what the bypass isolation transfer switch looks like. So again, it allows you to, uh, and, and you can notice, 
kind of the two doors so that you can work on one section without exposing yourself to the to the risks of the other one so there you go bypass isolation transfer switch don't have to have it right you could have a second transfer switch but i think it's probably worth your time to get a bypass isolation transfer switch instead of buying two transfer switches now redundancy that this requirement is not required if the need for an emergency system can be removed during maintenance without jeopardizing safety, or if the building's not occupied and the fire protection system, like a fire pump, uh, does not need another power source, or other temporary measures can be used for emergency power, which is what we're showing here, or if a written plan exists that mitigates the hazards during maintenance and repair. So you could potentially satisfy uh, some of these exceptions. I know one of the places that I consult for uh, once a year during uh, during the 4th of July weekend, uh, they, they shut down the entire plant, of course, except for the electricians. And the electricians uh, get paid, you know, double time or whatever it is, but they do all of the maintenance on the facility uh, during that weekend. And that might include testing the emergency system, repairing the emergency system, you know, doing all of that. And the need for the emergency system at that facility might just be emergency lighting. Well, you don't need emergency lighting in a building that's not occupied. So you could potentially meet this exception. Now, I think you'd have to have some, some written requirements to show the inspector that this is how you're doing it. You know, it, it's not something that's going to be a handshake type of discussion. Uh, but if you meet the exception, well, then use the exception by all means. But I think in most applications, uh, you're not really going to be able to meet this exception. Most places, you can't just completely take everybody out of the building long enough to do maintenance. So there you have it. Redundant transfer switches or a bypass isolation transfer switch. Whichever one you choose, you got to have one or the other. Uh, by the way, what I'm showing here in this picture, this is an example of the docking station that I was talking about earlier. Obviously, in the background, you've got a large generator, and that's their typical emergency power source for this building. And then on the left, you have the docking station where you can plug in using a single pole separable connectors. You can plug those in to a temporary generator. That way you can maintain the real generator, and just in case you need it, the temporary gener generator is ready for any sort of outage or, you know, to be called on if needed. All right, so there you go. There's our first video on Article 700. We'll see you next time when we talk more about emergency lighting.